You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for being here today. And I don't know if you know about the Free to Choose Network, but once you discover it, if you haven't already, you're going to love it. And uh, you're going to get many great benefits. And they have a new documentary about the great Thomas Sowell. The documentary is Thomas Sowell, Common Sense in a Senseless World at soulfilm.com. And joining me today to talk about both the Free to Choose Network and the new documentary about uh, Mr. Sowell is Robert Chatfield, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Free to Choose Network. And their website is freetochoosenetwork.org. Robert, thank you so much for joining me. Chris, thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here, truly. Let's start with what the let's start with the free to choose network because in the in the world of in of MAGA, <laughs> what free to choose offers is a glimpse into people like Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and taking their expertise and explaining it to common people. It's one of the reasons I love it. So, what is the free to choose network? I was going to say, if that name sounded familiar, it's because we are the media company that produced Milton Friedman's Free to Choose over 40 years ago, still going strong today. In fact, the original producer of Free to Choose is our still our founding chairman and still alive today. So I've been able to uh, work under his tutelage for the last three and a half years, essentially becoming, uh, as he put it, he had the longest post uh, postdoctoral Milton Friedman session of anybody in the world. Uh, in terms of his relationship. But what we've done is, is we make, uh, usually we make documentary films. Our distribution point is public television. And we choose public television on purpose because we know that's an audience that tends not to hear messages with regards to personal, political, and economic freedom. And those are the three things that I think Milton really wanted to emphasize. Again, personal, political, economic freedom. If you have all those three things, you're probably going to be happier, healthier, and wealthier than not. We then take those films, Chris, and normally we'll try to take and and parse 12 to 15 minute segments out of those to create classroom teaching videos. And so therefore, uh, a teacher is probably not going to show a one hour long documentary film in class. They just don't have that time. But if we can take a segment of it to 12, 15 minutes that we know is going to be useful in the curriculum, uh, we'll put that together along with the teacher's guide. Uh, We'll get it uh, 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 make sure that matches state standards for all 50 states plus Common Core if somebody's using that. We also, a little known fact, we own Milton Rose Friedman's former summer home in Vermont called Capitaph. And we bring college students there for week-long colloquiums where they literally study Milton Friedman's ideas in Milton's own living room. That's very cool. I'm a a big fan of Milton Friedman. I have hanging on my wall the books of Milton Friedman, which I won from the Friedman Foundation for – it's an educational choice foundation located here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. I love Milton Friedman, but there may be people listening who aren't familiar with Milton Friedman and the documentary Free to Choose. Can you talk about both the man and the impact of that documentary? Sure. Back in uh, 19, uh, it was 76 or 77, Milton Friedman was a Nobel, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize. And around that same time, PBS had put out a 14 hour series called The Age of Uncertainty, which essentially was 14 hours of uh, leftist economics. And I tend to not use right left, if you will, but this is about as as easy to point out as leftist economics as you can think. Uh, The uh, chairman for a corporation for public broadcasting at the time said, geez, we should do a response to this. And uh, again, our founder, Bob Chittister, actually founded WQLN, which is the Erie, Pennsylvania public television station. And he knew that Bob was a, a, a thinker in the terms of, he, Bob would never have called himself a libertarian. He didn't know what the word was, but he had that mindset with regards to being you know, free to choose. And so he introduced him to Milton Friedman. And in 1980, there was four channels on television. I know that's gonna shock still most of your, your users out there. You had ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS. And so you could get literally 10%, 15% market share of a television audience. And as I said, and that was the form of entertainment at the time. So to call the series groundbreaking, first of all, it was a 10 hour series because Milton didn't need 14 hours to respond and uh, much more concise and, 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 and persuasive beyond that one. But the concept of just introducing people that yes, there was this concept of free markets, free people, free ideas, you know, you used uh, situations such as Hong Kong to show that there was almost no natural resources there, yet the city blossomed. Why? Because it essentially said, let the people be free. 
And so that really resonated with a lot of people in terms of how we might steer direction. Then of course, Friedman became a policy advisor to President Ronald Reagan. And most of your uh, listeners probably know the, uh, the answer to that question afterward. Again, deregulation, freeing of the markets, freeing of the people. And that concept, I think, was really driven by Milton Friedman. Yeah, when I talk to libertarians here locally, you know, people who are in the older Gen X boomer age range, you know, you usually hear, uh, and even a lot of Republicans too, going back to the Reagan revolution, you usually hear, I picked up Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged, or I saw Free to Choose. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I don't think people appreciate how nascent the libertarian movement still is, and a lot of these ideas still are in the scope of history. And Milton Friedman has been a great messenger of free market economics for a long time. And so you, you've you expanded on just that documentary, and I know that there was a redo of the documentary. Um, give us a scope, an idea of the type of documentaries that the Free to Choose Network does. Uh, uh, we tend to focus on two or three different things. Uh, as you might have guessed, again, this uh, reason I'm on today is, is because we have a new biography on Thomas Sowell. And we've done several biographies that have been well received. We think that's something we do well in terms of highlighting people that might not otherwise get biographies. I have seen the Walter Williams Suffer No Fools one about three times mm -hmm. uh, and really, really love that uh, about the late libertarian econom econ economist, excuse me, mm -hmm. Walter Williams. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, it, this, by the way, I would be remiss if I did not tell you that George Schultz is 100 years old this year. Okay. So we have just re-released our three-hour series on George Schultz, which is actually getting pretty good airplay on public television stations as a re-airing right now. So we're really happy about that. Um, and then, of course, the biography of Milton Friedman before that. And as I said, I, that's sort of one genre we take a look at. Another thing we take a look at is economics. And a lot of, again, just free market economics. And most people, in the, they, they sit there and they might try to brand us as, oh, you guys must be conservative. Milton Friedman, Ronald Reagan, you guys are just conservative Republicans over there. Well, you know, we didn't agree with any of Donald Trump's trade policies. We rarely agreed with him on his immigration policies. There's a lot of things we would have disagreed with in terms of what people consider to be the Republican Party of Donald Trump or conservatism. And again, I try not to mention politics too often, but I want your uh, viewers and listeners to know, you know, that's not anything about what, what we're trying to be about. Almost all the films we produce, especially with regards to economics, are there so that they can be evergreen. We're trying to come up with topics that people, if you look at it 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, the topics are still relevant, the concepts are still relevant, the conclusions we reach are still relevant. And that's why Free to Choose 40 years later, again, is still, people are still amazed. We're still talking about the same issues. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of the Thomas Sowell documentary touched on a lot of things that we're still talking about. Correct. And then the next avenue that we're really trying to dive into a lot more is civics education. And that's, uh, we released a three hour series on PBS called A More or Less Perfect Union that featured Judge Douglas Ginsburg as the host. He did such a wonderful job on that program that we're gonna continue along those lines, uh, in including uh, we're now creating, uh, I'll give you a, qu a quick advanced uh, uh, notice of this one. We're now creating a short videos for each of the citizenship questions asked by the US Citizenship uh, and Naturalization Test. And so if you're gonna take the citizenship test, the pass rate on it is actually relatively high, yet most American citizens themselves could not pass the test. And that's really what we were looking at is, is can we make something that's more accessible so that people will actually remember what the concepts are and not just look at stuff and have rote memorization for answers. Listeners to this program will see a lot of common ground between the Free to Choose Network uh, and this program. We're talking to Robert Chatfield, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Free to Choose Network. Can people find all of those at freetochoosenetwork.org or on YouTube? Or if you, if you don't catch it on your local PBS station, how do you find it? You've hit it all, by the way. Amazon Prime also is a distribution outlet for us, but free to choose network.org. Uh, there's a place that uh, gives all of our broadcast programs. We're our, we are a nonprofit, so everything we produce, we make available at no cost to anybody. One thing that, one reason that I love Thomas Sowell is the concept of trade offs. And I think you really nailed it in this documentary. Uh, again, it's called Thomas Sowell Common Sense in a Senseless World. You know, where, where Steven Pinker's talking about, you know, Tom, Thomas Sowell's love of photography. 
and how when you make one adjustment here, you have a trade-off because you may get more color, but you're going to have more light or less light. You, there's always a trade-off. And so one thing that I've found in Thomas Sowell's work is that he, he he is very uh he does take moral stances right he does have a, a perception of right or wrong but he always tries to frame it in if someone does x then y can happen over here and the government often produces many trade-offs that we don't like no matter how good intention these people are they often don't is that like a common theme of Thomas Sowell's work or is that just something I'm specifically attracted to? But I imagine it is since you grabbed on it. So yeah, I, I was going to say, if I'll, I'll butcher the quotes, by the way, I'll try to, yeah. as I said, I'll, par I'll paraphrase Thomas Sowell instead of quoting him, but he'll tell you there are no government solutions, only trade-offs. So a, a line that you'll hear over and over from Thomas Sowell. And I think when you, uh, you hit on something and I'll give you another way of looking at that. Thomas Sowell will also often say, you know, it's not how you want things to be. You have to accept things as, as they are. Yeah. And so you might say, oh, my gosh, we would like, you know, oh, climate change. You know, we should end climate change. We should do something about climate change, if you will. Uh, but, you know, it, Thomas Sowell might look at climate change and say, you have to accept the fact that here's what the facts tell you. No matter how much you want to try to make something pigeonhole into something, if the facts tell you something, it has to lead you to a conclusion. Most of the time, his conclusion is the government program doesn't work and it just makes things worse. Well, let's jump back. I mean, who is Thomas Sowell? Why did you do a documentary on the man? It's a great question. And we, uh, I, I spun that question a different way. You mentioned Rand earlier because... I, I got tired of people saying, who is John Galt? Because I'm like, well, who is Thomas Sowell? You know, everybody sort of knows Thomas Sowell quotes. He's a very quotable person. He's all over. There's all sorts of videos on the internet with regards to Thomas Sowell. He has a lot of hard hitting, pithy lines. He actually appeared in the 1980 Free to Choose original series. I, I don't say we did not launch his career. He was a, a budding academic at the time. Uh, and was relatively well known inside some of those circles. But you know, that was we we made sure that he was a young rising star when he appeared in Free to Choose 40 years ago. So he's always been on our radar. But one of the concepts was Jason Riley, the host of this film, <clears throat> who is Thomas Sowell's authorized biographer, Jason wanted to humanize him. He said, you know, people see all of these things here, but how did he become Thomas Sowell? You know, he writes about his latest book out was Charter Schools and Their Enemies. Well, how did Thomas Sowell become an advocate for charter schools, if you will? You're right, he'll take a moral stance. And it turns out, well, Thomas Sowell was the beneficiary of school choice when he was a child. Back before anybody was railing about vouchers or charter schools or anything of that, there was school choice in New York City. If he didn't like the school he was at, he went to a different school. And he, and he says that made all the difference. And I think if you look at it from that perspective, a lot of Tom Sowell's life experiences have led him to the positions that he takes. Jason wanted to try to get a little bit deeper into those and to show the human side of Tom to say, this is, this is why he is like he is. He's not just somebody who's staking out a position. Uh, as most people know, Tom Sowell is actually very media shy. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't actually do a lot of interviews. He doesn't appear on TV. He's not one of those guys who's trying to be in front of the camera all the time. Yet he's well known as somebody who takes a contrarian view. And how did he get to that component? Obviously, it wasn't because he wanted to become rich and famous and a television star. He wanted to show people the facts and he wanted to show people the truth. Yeah, I mean, the, you if you go on YouTube and search for Thomas Sowell, the, the appearances of Thomas Sowell are in basically reverse order. One Dave Rubin appearance, like three interviews on Uncommon Knowledge and a bunch of fire in line with William F. Buckley from the 70s. Like yeah. mm -hmm. there's there's not much out there, but I think you raise a really good point and I think you nailed it with the documentary in that 40 years ago, free to choose on PBS was like a, a bright shining light in the darkness, right? Like in a sea of just monolithic media and now we have so many different forms of media that it's it's easier to kind of tell your story but when you look at Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, some of these folks who have kind of had these long careers they get truncated down into being the contrarian yeah and you sort of lose sight as to what motivated them and what I liked about like specifically the the charter schools segment that you just talked about is it really shows how deeply personal it was to him and why he chose 
you know, schooling and charter schools as an issue, you know, and why he picked certain things because he wanted to make it better for individuals who had the experiences that he had. And I think sometimes that's lost in some of these figures. They're, they're just evil people who have, they want to, they're fighting against the common good. And I think you really nailed why this is important to him. Yeah, thank you. And I'll give you the other reason for making the film, Chris, is what well, you and I certainly know who Tom Sowell is. Tom Sowell told Jason Riley, uh, who is the host of the program, by the way, he told Jason Riley, probably 95% of the people in the United States have no clue who he is. No. And for us, our biggest measure of success, and we're going to try to track this through statistics on our website, I don't know how successful we're going to be, is will people bounce off of the film website and go find out more about Thomas Sowell? Can we find out where they're going after the fact uh, to, uh, to see, are they, are they interested in, in learning more about Sowell and Sowell's ideas? And I think that's probably the biggest thing. If you go through some of the comment section that you see on the film, it's amazing to me that you'll have people say, oh my gosh, I just learned about Tom Sowell six months ago. Somebody just introduced me to Tom Sowell a year ago. And yet the guy has over 30 books. He was a syndicated newspaper columnist. And again, as I said, a leading thought uh, provider. Uh, and, and most it's because he didn't fit the narrative. He never fit the narrative. So he was never going to get the press. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about his books because he's written many great books. Yeah. I love A Conflict of Visions, which, you know, really breaks down the left-right mm-hmm. view of things. But Basic Economics, I think, is kind of his, his standard textbook about economics that everybody probably starts with. What are, what are some of your favorite Thomas Sowell books and what would you recommend if they want to jump in? I, I was going to say, if you can post this after the fact, I'll actually give you the titles of these. But in the uh, 1990s, he came out with, uh, it wasn't, I don't know if it was a planned trilogy, but he had three uh, books in a row that essentially were about culture. And it was when he was at the top of his game with regards to international research. And I'll, I'll get your listeners the title of them, but they were, you know, something along the lines of, you know, conquest and culture, race and culture, civilizations and culture, uh, very similar titles with regards to the books. But I think that's some of his best work. Soul himself will tell you that he had two favorites. I think he uh, liked the book Say's Law that he had done earlier in his career because it really talked about economic theory. And again, it gives you that underpinning for everything that was to come with regards to Thomas Soul after the fact. Yeah, I love controversial essays too. It's just, he's mm-hmm. such a clear and concise writer. We'll, we'll put a lot of titles in the, in the links, in the show notes. So if you want to grab one of his books and start reading. Uh, you know, obviously, he is. Re- he just retired from being a columnist, did he not? And I know that he's he's older. Yep. Yeah, I was gonna say. So yeah, he's 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 over the age of ninety now. He he retired as a columnist, and uh, we sort of address it a little bit. But you know, Tom himself even addresses it almost tongue in cheek to say, "My gosh, he went on a vacation and he realized this is great. If I don't have to do this every single week, listening to the news, etc." Uh, but he's still writing. And he's always going to be a prolific writer. I don't know what's coming out next, honestly, but uh, I, I heard he, you know, he's usually working on updates of, of past books. And almost always, it's he'll tell you if he can find the facts. So if he can find the facts and it's something of interest to him and he thinks it has been misportrayed somewhere and that people don't have the facts and can make, cannot make the, the decisions on their own, uh, that's the kind of stuff that Thomas Sowell is going to look at in terms of his own future writing. So while he's gone, uh, as I said, the most recent thing he did, obviously, was a tribute to his great friend, Walter Williams. And, uh, you know, just let you know how uh, how fleeting life can be. Yeah. And let's talk about Walter Williams and Jason Riley himself. Uh, yep. Jason Riley writes for the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. He wrote Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. Uh, you have the classic Buckley joke that, you know, the... The FAA keeps Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell off of a plane together because if it goes down, then both black conservatives will be lost. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, his, his racial identity did not define his work, but I think it was an important part of his work because so much of what he wrote was about his view on the world and his experiences in yeah. the world. How important was uh, just being a black conservative in a time when there were not many over the last 50, 60 years of his public life. I will state that uh, Tom, much to his chagrin, our program is mostly going to be aired in public television during Black History Month. (laughs) 
and and Tom did not want to be identified as a black conservative. Uh, you know, you could call him an economist, you could call him a philosopher, you could call him uh, something else. But to to put the adjective black conservative anything before him, uh, actually, Tom was never in favor of that. And while he uh, again was identified with that movement, if you will, because his ideas and his thoughts and philosophy most aligned with those. Uh, Tom would tell you, had, the color of his skin had nothing to do with how he came to his visions, how he came to that those philosophies. It was the facts. Yeah, and that that definitely comes across. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I asked that question last because I I just think he's, he's yeah. such a brilliant thinker, and mm -hmm. you know, it's I think it's easy for people to kind of pigeonhole someone into that one thing as mm -hmm. opposed. Well, to looking Walter, at by the way, was a little more open about that, and yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm not uh, spoiling this here. You know, if Walter would substitute for Rush Limbaugh, he would start his shows with "Black" by popular demand. You know, so <laughs> Walter had a lot of sense of humor, knowing that his views were contrarian to what the mainstream message was. But Walter also coined that wonderful phrase, the poverty pimps. And right. Walter would keep a, uh, a running total of the amount we need every year to lift everybody out of poverty. How much, how much would we actually have to give these people to lift them out of poverty versus how much did the government spend on programs trying to lift people out of poverty? And of course, the government programs always spent more than you would actually have needed to just give the people the money. Yeah, Walter Williams seemed to have a little sharper elbows and was a little more willing to wade into some of that stuff. But what I what I love about Soul and Milton Friedman that I just think really needs to be recaptured is that the facts that Soul researched mm -hmm. and the way that he wrote and the ideas that he held were provocative and provocative in and of itself mm -hmm. in challenging big government. You know, and they didn't need gimmicks. You know, they were very gimmick free. They were very expertise based, but they wrote to, for the common man. Yeah, especially as I said, you know, Milton and uh, uh, Milton, by the way, when he, we first started, Milton didn't want to do the television series. Really? Milton actually said, you know what, if they're going to be persuaded by watching an hour of me on television, then the very next hour they're going to watch something else and be just as persuaded there. Uh, it, we really had to persuade him that he could use mass media as a way of reaching people. And I think, as I said, Milton always had that ability, you're right, to speak to the common person and never talk down to that common person. I think Tom Sowell purposely does choose subjects and topics that interest him, that he knows from the facts that it's going to be a little bit controversial. Mm. So as I said, Tom's not gonna shy away from that. And what Tom does even better than anybody is, is just gives you that, that one phrase, that very memorable phrase that you can use to color something, if you will. And one of the ones, for example, that I love, he talks about you know, equality. Well, you can't get equality of outcome from people who grew up in the same household. You know, if you have <laughs> parents raising children, they don't come out equal. They don't come out in the same exact place. If you can't get it in the same household, how are you gonna get it in the nation? It is, I see him quoted on Twitter all the time. There's right. a Thomas Sowell account on Twitter that's obviously probably not run by him, but it's mm -hmm. like um, so retweeted. He really was a, he was like 40 years too early for Twitter. I mean, but he's yeah. really well versed for that medium. And I don't think he would have used it. As I said, you are correct. He, <laughs> he does not actually run his own his own Twitter account. So, so uh, final word, I mean, Give us give us the elevator pitch for the movie and and Thomas Soul and engaging in this and spending the hour with him. Why why should people get to know Thomas Soul more? I, I just think, as I said, this is one of the uh, projects we've done that I'm most proud of because we really did. We took the time to uh, to understand what made Tom Soul really. Who is Tom Soul? If you're looking for a greatest hits of all of Tom Soul's pithy sayings, quotes, etc., this is not the movie for it. This is the movie to sit down, watch, and find out how he became Tom Sowell, how he came to those philosophies. And then again, I hope what this really does is introduces an entire population of people to Thomas Sowell who have never seen him before. Free to Choose Network has been very happy uh, to uh, produce and work with Jason Riley uh, on this film, Thomas Sowell, Common Sense in a Senseless World. And I really do. I think it's one of the best one hour uh, uh, time blocks anybody can set aside. And you spell his last name S O W E L L. So if you're looking for it and you're Googling it, it's soulfilm.com. 
What do you have coming up next? Can you tell us what the Free to Choose Network is working on next? Absolutely. We uh, And it's already done in the can releasing this fall. And we may be, uh, uh, I'll, I'll foreshadow a little bit because I'm not supposed to do this one here. We hope to premiere at a certain festival in South Dakota this summer. Okay. Uh, a, a new one hour documentary on corporate welfare called Corporate Welfare, Where's the Outrage? It features our longtime host, Joan Norberg, uh, and we're going to look at the many strands of cronyism and why a bunch of people are funding a certain subsegment of the population. In other words, when people look at welfare, they, they mostly think of, my gosh, we pay welfare to these poor people. How much is the right amount should we pay these people? How should we distribute it? I've never once heard anybody said, you know what? Poor people in the middle class really need to support the corporations through reverse taxation more often. It's exactly right. Uh, well, we'd love to have you back to talk about that. Robert Chatfield, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Free to Choose Network. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for listening to The Chris Spangle Show, and we will see you again soon.